hello everyone and welcome um, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Arnon Mello. We're going to start this presentation. Our guest speaker today, Elise Resico, is going to be delayed a few minutes. She was called in uh, on a, a call with the consulate just a few minutes ago. She will join us as soon as she's off that call. So I want to thank her for uh, taking her time to participate and thank uh, all of you for watching this presentation today. So we're gonna start and um, wait for Elise to join us in a few minutes, okay? So um, we are doing this uh, webinar series um, to basically uh, try to bring awareness to everyone doing business, not only in Canada and South America or Brazil, uh, but also all over the world. So I hope you enjoy some of this uh, information that we're going to provide today. <clears throat> so the agenda today is to, to talk about uh, an overview, of course, Canada Mercosur, and I will introduce Elise when she uh, joins uh, the call. So again, my name is Arnon Mello. I'm the president for Mello Hawk Logistics here in Canada. We also have an office in the US and uh, we are an international uh, freight forwarder. We ship cargo of every kind to every destination and Brazil and South America are a niche market for us. Uh, our history, we've had, we have been in business for 17 years uh, with 150 partners worldwide. We've served over uh, 2,500 happy customers, and uh, we have a presence in 70 countries that we ship to. Uh, we do air freight, ocean, warehouse and distribution, and project cargo as well. Um, we are based in Toronto, as I said, but we cover the whole Canada. Uh, for those who uh, uh, forgot, Canada is a very large country, so very important to know where your customers are in Canada so we can provide the correct uh, logistic services for them. And as I said, South America is a key market for us. I'm gonna go into a, an overview um, of what we're facing uh, today. Uh, as you know, retail, commerce, entertainment, tourism, airlines, factories, all of it is uh, closed in Canada. People are working remotely like most of the places around the world. Um, and uh, essential services like our company, we are considered essential services because we are importing and moving product that is needed um, in the market. So we are open, half of our staff is working remotely and half is here in the office where we are. Um, and other essential services like energy, water, supermarket and pharmacies, they're open in Canada as well. Some of the challenges of course, cur currency, uh, issues around the world, credit and insurance. Um, a lot of uh, credit uh, in the supply chain have been, have been suspended and contracts have been put on hold at the moment because as you know, uh, we don't have uh, airlines flying as they used to fly, taking passengers and also in the same time taking cargo. So several routes around the world have been suspended from Canada and from other cities. So we are struggling finding space with few of the carriers that are doing um, uh, cargo uh, uh, only aircraft to some destinations. Working capital is an issue. As I said, most um, countries or suppliers are demanding payment upfront. So some clients are, are having to prepay for product uh, while before they had credit. So now they don't have it anymore. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the logistics side, uh, capacity is an issue. Uh, as I said, airlines uh, don't have the regular flights anymore. Uh, on the ocean side, things remain normal. Um, as far as we know, the only issue is the lack of equipment in some markets because, as you can imagine, China was shut down for a couple of months. Uh, I'm going to say the majority of products shipped worldwide come from China. And the containers that were used to move these products, they were um, not in their regular rotation. So 
they got delayed arriving at some markets and in consequence now those markets don't have equipment to load the, to load product uh, into them so there is a shortage in the supply chain as you can imagine and the feeling in the business community is uncertainty still for the future uh, we don't know um, how long um, some of the shutdowns will continue uh, we're hoping uh, soon things will go back to a certain normal and the business will be open as well clients will have their warehouse uh, operating again um, and uh, the fear that economic impacts will last for a long time of course as as we delay going back to normal uh, it will have a cascade effect another thing uh, that i would like to mention in regards to supply chain in canada the, the a lot of delays caused in delivering product and equipment is due to the fact that factories and clients uh, don't have their warehouse cannot receive um, uh, uh, product at this time and i also would like to encourage everyone to communicate with their logistics provider because at this time where clients don't have product a place to receive products a freight forwarder can help you uh, manipulate those goods or uh, remove containers from port taking it to different warehouses offloading them for you and avoiding further um uh, 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 demerge and storage on their product so uh, i encourage you if you uh, didn't work with a freight forwarder before communicate with them uh, exchange some ideas tell them your struggles and i'm sure they're going to help you um, uh, find a solution uh, remember we have contracts with many truckers and warehouses uh, and there is there's a lot of flexibility now uh, the more the more people we know on the chain, we can um, uh, help you um, offload those those shipments or or take them out of the ports uh, in in order to help the backlog. I'll wait for Elise to come in so she can comment uh, on uh, on the services of the Trade Commissioner uh, offices uh, in Brazil and where she's based or uh, around the world. I encourage everyone to also reach out to the Trade Commissioner Office uh, to find information about their local market in that country. So it has been um, uh, really insightful to exchange ideas with the Canadian government in different countries so we know exactly what that market is also facing and also our local agents in those markets. We get updates every day and uh, uh, from our network of agents and that is crucial to maintain us informed what's happening uh, around the world so hopefully Elise no. will come in yes Elise has just joined just a sec wonderful at the same time can you talk about the pricing in the freight industry as well uh, sure um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the air freight uh, situation that's happening right now, especially uh, for us in Canada and South America. As you know, Air Canada, or some of you know, Air Canada reduced their flights basically worldwide. There is possibly only five destinations that Air Canada is flying right now. And um, the options remaining to send cargo to Brazil and South America from Canada is via Miami. Miami has always been a hub for freighter service uh, going from Miami to pretty much every country in Latin America and in South America. And that has not changed. So the freighters are continue to move. Um, it's not a route that we normally used in the past for regular cargo because from Canada to Miami, from Toronto at least, it takes three days by truck to get to Miami, another day for loading and another day for shipping. If the cargo is coming out of Vancouver to Miami by road, it would take six to seven days until it reaches Miami. So you can imagine the delay that this has caused um, on this uh, on, on shipping by air. The rates for freighter service is more expensive than um, uh, regular passenger lines, but at the moment we don't have an option for uh, passenger airlines. 
And now Elise is ready to introduce herself, or Wonderful. you can introduce her actually. Go ahead. Perfect. So uh, welcome Elise Rassico, a senior trade commission for the Canadian government in Brazil. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I have a, a bio to read from Elise, but she has a distinguished career. She was the first Canadian woman to be a trade commissioner and vice consul posted to Islamic Republic of Iran. She focuses on climate change, clean development, development finance, intergovernmental relations. It has a keen interest in fields of development, education, promotion, women's rights, inclusion, diversity, and gen gender issues. So great to have you here, Liz. Thank you so much for joining. And I know you have a very busy schedule, so welcome. Thank you so much for having me and for inviting me to come here. Uh, I also just a uh, spoiler alert. Uh, I think that uh, many of the trade commissioners in the Brazil team uh, will be in touch uh, with uh, with uh, you, Fox at Melo Hawk, to uh, make sure that they also share some of their insight on specific sectors in the coming weeks. So, uh, just to, just for you to know, I know that uh, our teams are in touch to coordinate that as well. So, uh, stay tuned for that. It's a pleasure to be here today, and um, I know that uh, you had some questions prepared that you wanted me to go over, so uh, happy to start whenever uh, you want to. And sorry again for the delay. As you said, uh, these times are a little bit, um, for everybody, I guess, out of our normal. Uh, but here for uh, many of us uh, who are part of the Canadian Foreign Service and who remain at post, it also means uh, accepting all kinds of other challenges, including uh, trying to help on the consular front to ensure that uh, all Canadians who want to return to Canada in these times uh, are not stranded here or have the means to, to get there. And also that we uh, manage the, uh, the emergency front uh, of, uh, of our presence here. So uh, thank you so much for understanding and accepting me a few minutes late. Oh my God, no, thank you. I, I know how busy you are and we're, we're thrilled to have you. And I also want to mention, you probably did mention already, some people don't know that the, the senior uh, uh, trade office uh, in Brazil has six posts in Brazil to service the market with information. So, and you, you're responsible for those uh, six posts. So I want you to talk a little bit about the presence in Brazil specifically. Of course, uh, we do have actually a quite a big team, uh, the Trade Commission Service in Brazil. Um, and I think it serves us well in the sense of uh, ensuring that we have the, the right uh, men and women power uh, to, to help Canadian companies diversify in such a big uh, market as Brazil. Um, and big in terms of the number of people, but also in terms of its uh, geography, uh, a little bit like Canada. Uh, uh, the, the, the country is pretty, um, is pretty big and diverse, and so that explains a little bit why we have so many offices around the country. The, the biggest one being, of course, in Sao Paulo, uh, the, the economic capital and the, the really vibrant uh, financial center for, this, for, for the country. This is where most of our trade resources are located. Um, we, are, of course, have a presence in, uh, in the capital in Brasilia, where uh, the, the trade policy team and the relationship with the federal government happens and a lot of economic reporting as well. We have a, a team uh, based out of Rio, mostly focusing on energy, uh, other aspects as well, but uh, this is also where most of the um, energy companies, uh, including on the oil and gas front, have their uh, headquarters. And um, we also have an office in Belo Horizonte with similarly uh, a city that has a, a specific, uh, even though they, they offer other opportunities as well, but it has a specific uh, uh, vocation uh, in terms of the mining sector. Uh, and the mining sector has been traditionally one of the ones where Canadian companies have been really active in Brazil. So we do have a presence in that city as well, and it focuses mainly on that sector. Uh, finally, we do have a, a small office also in Recife and Porto Alegre. So in the northeast of Brazil, in Recife, and in the south of Brazil, in Porto Alegre. Um, so it, with, with different mandates as well, but also to, to cover those regions and to make sure that uh, companies who are interested in opportunities beyond the, the big cities uh, of Sao Paulo, Rio and, and the capital are also well deserved if they, they, they need to reach out and branch out into other uh, parts of the country. Amazing. So in total, 
we we usually we're based uh, on sectors so most of the members of my team and i mentioned maybe a few uh, might be participating to to future webinars with mellow hawk in the coming weeks uh, but they focus usually on one specific sector so that means uh, uh, we have specialists in, in IT, I mentioned mining, energy, uh, clean tech is another one, aerospace, uh, uh, industrial machinery and construction, so, it, and, and, and a lot more, but what I mean is that there's a lot of uh, sector depth and a lot of uh, really strong contacts in, in understanding of those sectors by the team, which is um, a luxury that we're really glad that we have so that we can uh, share it and offer it to the Canadian companies who are interested in the market. Great. And, and of course, Brazil, you mentioned how strong the, the, the office is and the presence is there. But just, just as a review, all over South America, you have a presence as well with the Trade Commissioner Office. So Canadians that are exporting to those, those markets can get support in many countries around the world as well, uh, like you of said, in, in different sectors, which is so important. Uh of course, uh, we do have offices uh, in many countries in South America, uh, but in total, uh, and the numbers change from one year to another, so I might be a little bit off, but it's about 160 offices that we have around the world, um, including a few in Canada, and I know many of you are based out of Toronto, and so we have a really uh, large and diverse group as well working there, helping directly companies to prepare for international market. Uh, so we also have a presence in Canada. Uh, but we've been uh, helping companies for over, well, this year, I guess, is our 125th anniversary. <laughs> so yeah. we're, we're, uh, we've been, uh, I, I guess, uh, pre-existing uh, the diplomatic presence of Canada um, in, in, the, in many ways. Uh, you know, we're a trading nation. And so that role of uh, opening doors and for markets has been an important one for the construction of our country. And I think it continues to be, especially in these times where, um, you know, the world economy is going to uh, see a, probably a lot of changes uh, as it is. We're already seeing many of them, but we're, we can expect that many things will, will also change in terms of the, uh, where the opportunities will lie and where the new maybe difficulties also will, will appear. And um, so our role, I guess, is to try to make sure that we, uh, we can uh, translate as much as possible of this information so that it's uh, understandable and, and made available to Canadian companies. Yes, yes. And, and going into that topic, I want to move to risk uh, and opportunities. And um, we know that, you know, around the world and not only in Canada, people had to look for other markets looking or searching for product and adapting what they were doing before because of COVID. So many things changed. So I want to ask you, uh, what type of inquiries are you getting uh, from Canadian companies in Brazil? Are Canadians looking for some things that Brazil can offer and vice versa? Is Brazilians looking uh, from help uh, from Canada at this time? Uh, I think everybody is trying to, <laughs> to find help from everywhere at this uh, point in time in our history, uh, especially when it comes to, um, to, to, protective, uh, to personal protective equipment, to testing for COVID and, and to uh, um, that, that old value chain, chain related to, um, to managing this crisis. Um, I think uh, a lot of disruption in supply chains and a lot of outbidding by between countries has made it really difficult and um, countries are also trying to protect as much as possible what they have nationally so that they can attend their own population. So there's been a lot of uh, requests on both sides, I think, but um, we can see in Brazil um, that a little bit like in Canada, I guess, uh, a lot of uh, local companies are adapting their, uh, their production to uh, ramp up their capacity to produce some of those things locally, uh, given the, the huge needs that they have and the, the difficulty to procure those, uh, the, those elements. Um, that being said, we also continue to see uh, Canadian companies in, in a variety of sector uh, continuing to do business here and vice versa. Um, we continue to see a lot of uh, Brazilian startups still looking uh, at uh, implementing their plans to internationalize through Canada, for instance. I had a few cases that come to mind this week. Um, we also see uh, some of our uh, regular clients, actually some new opportunities arising because uh, as uh, in many other countries, uh, but maybe uh, with uh, an expressive uh, way in Brazil, 
as uh, those of you who have been doing business or looking at doing business in this market, uh, you probably already know that uh, it's a well known for what we sometimes call Custo Brasil. Uh, you know, all those difficulties sometimes of red tape and, and the bureaucracy to actually get into the market. Well, the, the crisis has actually been um, uh, helpful in a way in, in, in lifting up some of those um, difficulties uh, that, that are usually uh, uh, in place because of uh, the difficulty of governments to move quickly on those elements. Uh, the crisis yeah. made it uh, a little bit uh, easier to, to move some of those pieces quickly. Uh, just recently, while this is going on, for instance, the state of Sao Paulo has been able to pass their pension reforms. That's a good example. A lot of um, provisory measure, I guess, what we call medidas uh, provisorias, mm -hmm. uh, that were taken uh, are allowing a lot more flexibility that uh, local companies have been asking for a long time, for example, on the labor front, just to name that one. Uh, so, so there are actually some silver linings there in terms of the ability of companies to do business here. Uh, this morning, one person in, in my team was just sharing how a Canadian company who's been wanting to do business here for a while uh, is now able to because uh, some of that regulation uh, that was a bit of an impediment or, or a challenge uh, before for them to, to be uh, able to uh, succeed has now been lifted. And so um, there are some opportunities that arise in, in every crisis, I guess. But in Brazil, I think uh, uh, it will definitely um, help to speed up some of the reforms that the country has been wanting to do, but has added still difficulties uh, politically and administratively to pass them through. Yes, my God, I, I can just imagine. And yes, I think as I, as I have a slide on, um, risk uh, and disruption bring opportunities as well and that's what you're talking about people are looking and and being I guess more active or, or looking for other options wherever they can and one thing that I want to bring up and I want you to talk about quickly I know your time is limited but um, you have been instrumental in the women in mining gender equality initiative that was just launched so many so many women leaders were involved in that. Can you talk about that and, and the effect that women have in mining in Brazil, for example? Uh, this is a, actually some a really good news that we had this week. And I want to also salute the efforts of my colleague, our Consul General in Rio, who's been like spearheading this, this, uh, uh, this piece uh, together with, with uh, many partners, both in Canada and locally. And I've been really glad to be able to support those efforts. Um, it, it's been uh, more than a year in the making, and so we were hoping to be able to do those uh, celebratory uh, announcements in a different way, but like many other things, they had to be virtual, I guess, yes. uh, given the times we live in. Um, but this is, um, as uh, some of you might be uh, involved with the mining sector, uh, might be aware, in, in Canada, we do have like a woman in, in mining action plan and a year and a month ago, I guess, more or less at uh, PDAC 2019 uh, in Toronto, there was a discussion that took place on how we could maybe uh, leverage this document that existed in Canada and bring some of those good ideas to Brazil. And so there's been a lot of work to get through uh, the point we're at today. Um, but basically there was a, the adoption of those principles and this action plan. A lot of uh, companies, uh, including big ones like Valley, have been instrumental in, in, uh, in also promoting the, the plan and adopting it. Um, and so it has like different kinds of measures and, and inclusion of, of uh, gender diversity in the workplace, but also in terms of um, uh, the community relationships, uh, which are really important uh, in a sector like mining as well as in the supply chains of the mining sector. So uh, this is something that uh, there's been a lot of interest uh, in Brazil. Uh, I've been also doing a lot of work in that uh, gender diversity element with, uh, with the industry and with FSB, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so for those who don't know what FSB is, it's uh, the largest uh, industry federation in Brazil. It's the one for the state of Sao Paulo. And so they're, they're, it was something that they had never had done until this year. And uh, there's been a huge interest since we started doing that work. And the last actually public event I participated to before we, we got into this uh, lockdown period was uh, on women in, in the industry um, So with the CSP. So there's a lot of enthusiasm on many themes that uh, when I was first in Brazil from 2008 to 2015, uh, were not necessarily on the radar screen that much. But uh, and again, I think it's a, 
it's a sign of crisis uh, that we can learn from crisis. Brazil from 2015 to 2018 went through a, its own uh, set of difficulties with the uh, Lava Jato or car wash uh, operation, as some of you will remember. Um, and that uh, drove uh, a lot of private sector companies to rethink the way that they, uh, they're doing business and uh, the way that they perceive their uh, responsibility as a social actor as well. So how do they uh, adopt principles that show that their corporate uh, corporate uh, risk response socially responsible as a corporation let's put it this way um so so those um, those elements you know whether it's on diversity and gender diversity is really important of course especially in in, in uh, traditional sectors like the mining sector i think it's quite obvious but also in brazil other kinds of, of uh, diversity and inclusion elements uh, uh, whether uh, racial or otherwise or, or for social classes are also really key in uh, in lifting up this country economically. So uh, that's also been part of, of many of the uh, interesting discussions we've seen. Plus, uh, I think this uh, work on, on trying to be more um, environmentally and, uh, and uh, responsible and having a better governance uh, of uh, large organizations has all came mm -hmm. a, a little bit as a result of this, um, uh, this crisis that made the private sector look at itself again and say, oh, how can we do better? So uh, the, again, silver linings in crisis, but we're reaping the fruits of that to a certain extent, uh, I believe, with some of the, those results, including uh, the one that you just mentioned with the Women in Mining Action Plan. Amazing. And Elise, do you, what, what areas do you see that are there's a real growth right now in Brazil, despite the COVID or the COVID has interrupted everything, disrupted this this movement that you talked about do you, do you still think business is growing between canada and brazil what is your take on that well uh, it, it's it's a little bit fuzzy right now so it's hard to say where, where things will stand and i think not just between canada and brazil but i think globally uh economy and trade will will be affected by that uh, so so to say what exactly the the level of the impact will be i think we're a little bit too close to it to be able to say uh, but I think there are, and again, you know, it's like finding those uh, those little pearls in, in the middle of, of the difficulties. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we see that certain sectors are are expected to 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 um, to do better than others uh, as a result of what's going on, and we're having those reflections here internally. And I know the state of São Paulo is also doing like a the uh, impact assessment by sectors at the moment and we're we're really look, we're looking forward to have a bit of a, a better idea of what they're anticipating on their hand but we we can see uh, uh, even in sectors for instance where we would expect a really negative impact uh, like aviation for example and I know you were talking about that when I just entered um, the call. Uh, this is an area where we continue to see uh, a lot of business going on and Canadian companies who are active in Brazil in this sector continue to uh, to fare relatively well and haven't uh, stopped their operations, so, which is already a good sign in those days. Um, so, so there are uh, like pockets, you know, uh, maybe like the uh, passenger uh, driven part of the aviation has definitely slowed down as, as did the tourism elements. Uh, but the commercial uh, like freight um, part is continuing. Uh, the uh, maintenance, repair and overall need to continue as well and parts as well. Um, and, and you see that even uh, large Brazilian OEMs, you know, like Embraer are, are also adopting, uh, ad adapting a little bit what they do. Um, a little bit like we see in Canada for many companies, uh, Embraer is part of, uh, you know, the many companies who are trying to uh, to uh, to provide uh, support to uh, produce locally some respirators and, and maintain them uh, mm -hmm. for the healthcare system. So uh, the, there's a lot of things that continue to go on, even in the, the darkest maybe <laughs> corners of what we would expect. <laughs> uh, we can see that uh, in the construction infrastructure sector, uh, you know, it's, it's it, here it's since the beginning, construction has been considered as essential. Uh, so even if uh, things have slowed down in commerce and whatnot, uh, construction has continued. Uh, so this continues to be the case. And we can expect that as a, a stimulus package, you know, uh, for, for the economy to stay as much as possible on track or at least uh, not to suffer too much from a depression after this. 
that governments uh, with the help likely of, of uh, international financial institutions will look at stimulating the economy as we often do through infrastructure investment. So uh, we expect that this is a sector that will continue. Uh, actually, we've seen a lot of um, uh, construction, you know, qu really quick construction of like mm -hmm. hospitals that were in certain cases uh, supposed to be temporary and that will in fact remain uh, for a longer period. Uh, we're seeing also a lot of new, um, uh, and there will be winners and, 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 and losers, I think, in many sectors. Uh, I'm thinking fintech, for example, which is a really dynamic sector in Brazil, because especially in Sao Paulo, because of the uh, number of, of really powerful banks, uh, well established uh, in this financial capital, a little bit like in Toronto, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but but there's been um, it, there will be difficulty w with the funding side of that uh, innovation in startups uh, as the economy retracts. But at the same time, uh, there, there's also a lot of innovations that are happening when you see, for instance, that uh, it's still only about 30% of adults in Brazil that have a bank account. Um, and, and now uh, with uh, some uh, transfer programs that the government are putting together to help people who are part of the informal economy, for instance, uh, they're able to bring in through uh, FinTech uh, some of those, uh, the, those people into the, the more formal economy. So uh, bringing in the new consumers eventually, but also, um, you know, allowing to, uh, uh, to scale up some, some technologies that are being developed here. Um, Brazil has also been for a really long time uh, a leader, but also a partner of Canada in uh, the healthcare and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and biotech side. A lot of research being done in common for many years and public healthcare as well. Um, and, uh, and they're blessed, I guess, with the, what is supposed to be the, the largest uh, public healthcare system in the world. And on top of it, there's a, a strong private one. So I think. Um, uh, this is a, a place where the, the crisis will, of course, uh, put a lot of pressure on the system, but also will put a lot of uh, new uh, resources as well and, uh, and will require a lot of uh, innovation and creativity. So that's one place where I think there will be uh, some, some, uh, some positive things going on. Um, I think uh, okay. the oil and gas sector has been suffering, but not only because of the COVID uh, uh, virus, but also uh, because of uh, the crisis, you know, with the OPEP and, and the, the, the prices being uh, driven down. So that has affected uh, the sector here as it does in Canada and anywhere around the world, uh, pretty much. So this is uh, still a, an interrogation mark, uh, how this will unfold in the future mm -hmm. uh, after this. But for sure, you know, the, the number of cars in the street of Sao Paulo <laughs> are definitely less than usual and the number of planes that I see from my window <laughs> also <laughs> less than usual. So probably okay. a lot less uh, fuel being used. Uh, so, so, you know, I think we need to really look at each and every sector and try to think uh, what's going to change in the sector and where some, because there will always be opportunities. Mm -hmm. Some things will be mm -hmm. harder but some things will be made easier and, and will require more uh, solutions. So I think that's where we need to focus. Mm -hmm. Perfect. No, yes, I, I agree with you and, and thank you for that information. And, and I know you don't have very much time, but I have to ask you, the Canada-Mercosur trade agreement. I mean, there's been so much talk about it. Do you think in the post-COVID era, things will change in terms of negotiation and multilateral uh, cooperation between Canada and Brazil? Uh, it, it's really hard to say. I think the the, the negotiations were going uh, pretty well. There's been a, you know a change in government on our side that made it a little bit longer between uh, some rounds of negotiation. And the one that was supposed to happen in March, of course, uh, was cancelled <laughs> due mm -hmm. to the situation. Yes. Um, so whether you know uh, we'll have virtual negotiations or, or whether we'll have to wait after uh, this period is unclear. But I think. Many governments right now are focused on uh, just dealing what's at their hands, uh, mm -hmm. including here and uh, including in Canada. Um, as I said before, you know, all of our team, not maybe not everyone, but including mm -hmm. myself, have been uh, becoming more of a consular officer <laughs> in many ways yes. in the last few weeks. So, um, so that includes any of our staff. So I can see delays. Uh, what's mm -hmm. going to be the world like afterwards? Uh, there are some protectionist tendencies that are happening around the need for 
uh, locally producing uh, some vital, you know, uh, equipment or even food supply or whatnot. And I think we, we see that in Canada and, and we see that pretty much everywhere. I think people were uh, suddenly realizing how hard it is if you, your supply chain is suddenly disrupted because, uh, you know, you count so much in many cases in China and uh, it, what happens if you don't have access to it. So I think it will definitely have an impact on how people are uh, in countries are organizing their international trade. Uh, but I think it remains even more important than ever to, to maintain open trade links in, in a world where we, uh, we, we rely a lot on each other and, and those problems are, are at world scale and not necessarily at a country level. So, uh, so it, it will have an, a, a political mm -hmm. lens to this, of course, and, um, and we will have to see, uh, you know, uh, I can think, for example, that the next uh, US election will, will give us a good idea Mm -hmm. of what the reaction uh, uh, and the choices of people in, in our democracies are, are going to lean towards. But um, I'm, I'm certainly a believer in international trade mm -hmm. and the importance of it. Uh, so uh, yeah. I, I like to remain positive and think that uh, this is still going to be on the table. And, and, and I, for Canada, international trade uh, is, uh, is vital. So as I said before, we've been uh, doing this job for now 125 years. So I uh, certainly intend to continue, but uh, we will need to to have a look again at what the world looks like when we all emerge from this uh, uh, right. worldwide lockdown. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more, but I also th uh, think, as I said, people are looking, they learn more how to look for alternative markets and local source products and rethinking their production schedule and looking for local products to to stay afloat. And and yeah. uh, and I think we all learn personally as well how to interact with our colleagues and how much teamwork came even when you're working remotely from your homes. It seems mm -hmm. that I have a sense that people are more engaged and dedicated and and really determined to overcome the difficulties. So I I think that we have to be positive always. And one thing that I can, and, and I, I certainly agree with and echo your comments. Uh, this is also how I feel with our team here is that everybody's stepped up and adapted really quickly to the new challenges, mm -hmm. including the fact of being isolated and working remotely, but working more together maybe than ever before. Um, so there, there, again, another silver lining, I guess. Um, but I think it's important to, for us anyway, in our role as a trade commissioner service, we're also thinking, that uh, this will be uh, you know, a big change in the way that companies do uh, interact between themselves. Uh, I think we'll likely see an increase in uh, um, virtual matchmaking and virtual mm -hmm. um, uh, missions and events uh, rather than necessarily uh, international travel and, uh, and you know, big conferences like that, that were trademarked of the, the maybe the past way of doing business. Um, I, I think we'll see that acceleration of the digital transformation of, of yeah. international trade. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, this is a, an interesting time where I think we're all kind of on the learning curve of how to interact in this new world. Um, but I'm sure that business will see a lot of uh, good reasons to maintain this, you know, for saving costs. And, and quite mm -hmm. frankly, there are also, uh, you know, a, a lot of companies have, uh, um, environmental plans that are, you know, reducing their carbon footprint and whatnot, and yes. what a great opportunity to do that, you know, when when we're learning how to uh, to relate to each other in in this virtual world. So, uh, so I certainly think that we need to change the to reinvent the way that we uh, we support companies and that companies are uh, engaging internationally. It's not going to be, uh, you know, black and white, but certainly going to be uh, a lot more gray. Uh, in the future and and we need to prepare for that yes and as you talked about a, a digital area we, era we see here in canada as well in the supply chain and customs clearance we're very digital in canada and very easy to customs clearance but so, even some paper uh, trail details we had before are now being eliminated because people cannot go to a counter and clear things so so i i think covid helped even more adapt some markets to going completely digital 
and we can see how much we can do and, and, and not have a piece of paper or print a piece of paper and go to a customs counter or that things are being done uh, with an email uh, and an electronic, uh, electronic approval of, of a clearance. And this is happening all over the world. Not only here, we already advanced. Brazil is very paper oriented still, but I know things are also changing in Brazil in terms of importing products, especially during this time. So I, again, I see a positive impact in certain uh, areas. I agree with you, and I think uh, those changes that we do ourselves within our own organizations, and we see them, you know, I'm, I'm now able to, to, to approve leave and, and expenses electronically rather than signing in a piece of paper. Um, so, so that's just a... One personal example, but I think uh, that adaptation is happening really quickly at a large scale in all organizations, and and there will be a big benefit to that. You know, we keep talking about digital transformation in various industries, and I think this was already happening. Happening. But mm -hmm. but the the. Um, the rate at which it now needs to happen, uh, in a way, it's unleashed that power. And you know, when we talk about Industry 4.0, I think uh, we, we'll see it much quicker now uh, because of all of those changes happening. And you're right that it's going to also debureaucratize a lot of processes and, and maybe make it easier uh, to, to do business in parts of the world that were burdened by um, administrative red tape. Correct. And Elise, I know before I, 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 you know, I let you go because I know you're so busy. You had another call. Can you can you give some advice um, uh, to companies when they're trying to penetrate into a different market and in order to to find alternatives? Can you give some advice to those companies listening to us? What they can do to to better themselves? I guess. Well, I, th I think you first need to be really aware of uh, you know. Uh, what's your value added and how you compare with your competition, what exists out there. So research, I think, is really important. Uh, you know, having uh, uh, maybe not all pieces answered yet, but having a pretty good idea of, you know, how you're going to be um, competing, establishing your prices and whatnot. It, it, it's really, you know, it sounds really basic, but I think it's, uh, it's sometimes so different than, than at home that uh, it's, uh, it's really important as part of decision making and choosing a market. And, and, and this is also part of some of the, you know, in, in Canada services that uh, the Trade Commissioner of Service can offer, but also um, colleagues that we have at the BDC, the, the, the Bank, uh, Business Development Bank of Canada. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And other, uh, you know, there are also excellent services at the provincial level in, in, in pretty much all provinces across Canada. So uh, I think that preparation, you know, and being ready and, and, and having uh, often sufficient also uh, uh, bandwidth, you know, to, to take a market in Canada. We have a small market. Yes, many of us, uh, you know, do business with the U.S., is a really important market for sure, uh, but, it, but but for those of you who do, you already know how uh, more uh, uh, how big it is in comparison with Canada and the difficulty that sometimes it means for scaling up. Well, a big market like Brazil can also present those challenges. So I think that part of like uh, analyzing, you know, your positioning and what do you really want and can offer is really important to research and really understand that. Um, and I think reaching out to uh, to, to organizations like ourselves, you know, once you're uh, considering, yes, I, okay, that seems to make sense for me to do business in Brazil, um, to make sure that you consult uh, with, with us, with our team, to get like a, uh, the, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, insight and contacts that we can mm -hmm. share for free. And so, you know, I guess yes. we're mm -hmm. all paying taxes. It needs to serve. <laughs> yes. So I, uh, I, use, I, use and abuse. Um, I, I, think I think you said you said a key word, free. People don't realize that <laughs> the Canadian government offices around the world are there to service Canadian companies trying to pen penetrate those markets. So use, use their resources. Yes, and, and we do in Brazil also have, count on our colleagues from uh, Export Development Canada who can help yes. also alleviate some of the risks that exist, you know, uh, uh, transactional risk or otherwise, you know, with insurance products and guarantees and, and, and other uh, financing. Uh, so that's also an important tool that needs to be considered. Uh, I've mentioned, you know, uh, provincial governments. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, the Quebec government is here, but also uh, Ontario is quite active in this market, you know, organized 
organizing a lot of uh, activities and and so um as are other uh, provinces as well but i think they also can complement really well some of the work that we do and they, they should definitely be uh, engaged as well in the process uh, the, the more uh, the better probably um and and uh, i think that uh, usually we would say visiting the market is key. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a pause on this one, yes. especially as <laughs> for for now. But even if it's a virtual visit, you know, I think engaging and talking with uh, the local contacts. And, and maintaining that relationship, I think, uh, especially in a market like Brazil, where relationships are key, uh, I think is, is, is an important part of, of doing business here. Uh, a lot of successful, and it's not a, it's not a sine qua non, uh, you know, uh, element, uh, but a lot of companies who are successful here, uh, Canadian companies successful in Brazil, do have sometimes in their staff uh, a Brazilian Canadian who kind of knows their local language and, and, and understands a little bit more, maybe some of the some of the customs and uh, and, and uh, values and whatnot and can help you navigate that's always useful uh, i think associations like uh, the bccc for example the brazil canada chamber of commerce or here in brazil the the, the ccbc a bit of its equivalent locally uh, are also really good uh, resources in in uh, providing that kind of um, uh, cultural information and how to do business uh, for, with a more general view on, uh, and uh, in guidance. I think that's also uh, important. So partner. So my first thing would be research. The, the second one, use the, the partners that you have, mm -hmm. uh, especially those who yeah. are free, <laughs> but also yeah. uh, equip yourself well with, um, with support uh, from um, you know, consultants, whether it's on the logistical side, on the legal side, um, on the tax side, hopefully this will also be uh, easier in due time. Uh, but th these are elements where expertise is really important uh, in a country like Brazil. And there are programs that exist in Canada that can help a company who wants to enter a new market uh, to alleviate some of those costs and, and pay uh, half of them, for instance, uh, with a Canadian program called CanExport. But provincial yeah. programs also exist that can sometimes complement that. So uh, I think using those funds, again, that are there for, for companies to use is, uh, is, is part of the solution um, and can help to alleviate the risk as well by reducing the, uh, the, the, the cost of entry. So yeah. research, partner, partner, and leverage what is there that governments are offering you. Perfect. And when, again, when we can travel and visit people in person, then make a visit to Brazil or to your customer, wherever they are, because th that changes so much the relationship. For now, we can do Zoom calls. Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> so at least if you can see each other, I think we can establish a contact. So um, I, I believe that we'll be able to find ways to relate uh, and to create those contacts and and to create warmer relations in the cybernetical world <laughs> that we live in. Um, but uh, definitely building the relationship is important. And if it can be in person, that's great. But if it can't, uh, there are other ways that we can uh, reinvent uh, that part. But it will remain important that that personal touch, uh, that personal contact exists. Absolutely. Always good to have a Brazilian little cafezinho when you, when you are in Sao Paulo. So there you go. <laughs> Elise, I, I want to thank you so much. I know you, you have another call. I, I can't thank you enough for taking part of this. Uh, our guest uh, today is Elise Resico, the Senior Trade Commissioner for Brazil <clears throat> and leads the Canadian Trade Program <clears throat> Excuse me. with six Canadian offices throughout Brazil. She sits on the global board of the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service. So Elise Rassico, thank you so much for your insight and for being here today. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I hope this was useful. It was uh, really informal and, and uh, less prepared than I would have liked to given the circumstances, but uh, uh, happy to, to entertain any follow-ups. So if people have uh, more questions or would like to be uh, pointed in the right direction to the trade commissioner that works in their sector or whatnot, uh, please, uh, you know, you, you can, uh, through uh, Arnon, you can, uh, you can reach me if you want to, and uh, I'll be happy to make those introductions. Uh, I, you are always so prepared, so don't worry about it. The, <laughs> everything you always talk about is so relevant to, to the problems we're facing. So thank you so much. I look forward to talking to you and your team in Sao Paulo again, because we're always in communication with them, but, but it's always so good to, to, to have you here. So thank you so much. 
thank you so much for having me and hope everyone has a, a nice uh, weekend disconnecting a little bit from, from phones and screens and uh, everybody stay healthy. You too, take care. I'm gonna be staying on the call a little longer. I have some uh, questions to answer, but thank you and have a great weekend. Okay, bye. Bye. I also want to thank everyone that is on this call, the Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce, the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce, the CCBC, Câmara de Comércio Brasil Canada in Sao Paulo, the FCBB who is joining and all the, uh, uh, everyone that is joining from uh, Sheridan, Lambden, Centennial, Humber and Seneca College. So thank you uh, everyone that is, that is on this call and um, uh, what great information from, uh, from Elise. So again, I, I can't thank her enough and her team in Sao Paulo who always keep us informed what's happening uh, on the ground. I want to go back to um, the slides that we had prepared <clears throat> as I was waiting for Elise to come in, but um, she mentioned, of course, uh, Canada has many programs, EDC, Export Development Canada. Uh, if you are a Canadian company exporting a product or a service worldwide, this organization can support you so much, not only financially, but also protecting you from risk on your receivables worldwide. So, so I encourage you to speak to them, the BDC as well, uh, uh, can uh, provide financial support. And some of the ideas here, thinking forward, uh, search for government assistance, of course, renegotiate contracts and review processes. This is the best time for you to really look at what you're doing as a company, a structure, and your market, and see w what else can you do, right, within your organization. Rethink your communication strategy with customers and partners, crucial, more than ever now, uh, we cannot be in person with those clients and partners, so we have to uh, communicate with them via Zoom or phone them or phone or email. So it is it is the best time to reach out and say, what else can I do for you? How can we work together? How can we come up with solutions together? And and every bit of information that we share with South American partners will be valuable news to them. And that's why we're doing these webinars. We're trying to share what we're going through in Canada and uh, try to educate as many people as we can and also hear from them uh, the challenges they're facing in different countries so we can better service them. And that's what we're doing with, with our clients. Um, I don't know if any of you, I will uh, take the presentation off, if any of you on the line have any specific questions or comments that would, would you like to share? And again, thank you for being here. I know we had some questions on our chat and I think I covered them um, with uh, Elise. That's why I was, I was asking some questions for her. But if any, any of you on the line um, have any questions for me or even uh, questions for Elise that I can uh, send it to her um, um, uh, after this call, I will uh, uh, please uh, let me know. So I guess uh, we, yeah, we extended our time already. So I'm going to thank you again, everyone, very much for uh, being here um, and thank you for participating. We're going to be sharing this presentation uh, at a later time. We'll be sending a little survey if you can please uh, answer it. It's good for us to know what we're doing right or wrong. And um, please uh, pay attention to um, other guest speakers we're going to have in the coming weeks to talk about different markets and different uh, possibilities uh, for everyone. So anyway, thank you so much for joining. Great to see so many people here and have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.